Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the Embodied Runtime. Uh, my name is Dennis, and uh, I work at Lumber. And we are a software studio with a global network of developers. Um, we work with various brands, um, including Casper, Razy, Choosy, Patagonia. Uh, we worked with work WorkFrame for a long time. Um, and you might know us from some of our projects. Uh, back in the day, that was Vimsical. Um, I worked on Duct as well. Uh, we have Zeal, which kind of recently got a sneak peek on Reddit, on the Clojure Reddit. Um, we also made a Auth0 uh, Clojure wrapper. Um, and then most recently, we're, we're working on a generative um, art uh, t-shirt store where uh, t-shirts are competing with each other based on sales. And uh, t-shirts that sell can have baby t-shirts. Um, you know, it's pretty interesting. It's inspired by Twigimi to a degree. Um, yeah. OK, back to the embodied runtime. So uh, this was all kind of triggered. It took a long time to arrive at this. Um, but I think it kind of started with me organizing uh, two closure bridges back in the day. And uh, for those who don't know, Closure Bridge is a two-day closure programming workshop uh, for underrepresented groups in tech, uh, mostly beginners. And um, I, I think everyone had the best intentions. We had uh, more, we had more programmers, um, more facilitators that knew how to code than uh, we had uh, people that needed help in, in some of them. But overall, I feel like they were a failure. And I think most uh, two-day programming workshops are a failure. It's just we're just not going to teach a beginner to code in two days. Um, and you know, instead of developing an excitement in programming, people developed something like a major headache and uh, imposter syndrome. So um, that stuck with me, but I didn't know what to do about it. And uh, over the years, I just reflected on that and on my own experiences. Uh, I remembered how much I struggled to code, to learn to code. Um, I even remember skipping error messages because uh, I just I, it, I just couldn't take it that I was wrong this consistently, it's too too wrong too often. Um, so it, it made me feel feel better not to read error messages, even if they would help me. Um, so you know I got eventually I, I kind of got the hang of it, but the idea that learning could be better didn't let go of me. And uh, I started a startup that essentially uses version control as a learning tool. That's whimsical. You might have heard about it 2017. Um, and then while running that startup, I started doing stand-up comedy um, with the excuse that it will make me better at pitching to VCs. So uh, it's kind of traumatic to do stand-up for the first time. But um, it was fun, and I'm thankful for it. And it all led to embodied code or the embodied runtime. Um, I then went down the rabbit hole of visual programming, uh, making Duct. Uh, Duct is this kind of graphical tool where every node is an AWS Lambda, and you can just write individual functions and wire them up. Um, and I also joined a freeform dance communities in New York City. Um, some of They're called Ecstatic Dance and Gaga people. Don't expect you to know them, but the idea is that you can move however you want, as long as you don't harm anyone. Um, so taking all of this, um, I eventually connected the dots, and a new idea em emerged. And that idea is the embodied runtime. Um, so let's look at some code. Um, what do we see here? Just like read it. Is it big enough? Yeah? OK. Uh, just give it a read. Good. Um, so what do you think will happen when we evaluate draw? What do you expect to happen? Does anyone imagine a canvas to pop up, like a blank screen? Anyone? OK, a few people. Cool. Um, does anyone imagine that there will be points, or dots, or lines showing up on that screen? OK, right? Like, this is, this is sort of 
we all, as programmers, have a mental model of you know, seeing a bunch of text on a screen and reading it, interpreting it, and being able to understand what probably goes on in this code. In a way, we have a mental runtime, right, where we run this code, and then we run it on the computer and we compare if we were right, if we made the right assumptions. Now, what do you think beginners see? Right, they just see gibberish. They just see it, it makes no sense whatsoever, right? Um, and then we were like, okay, we will, we will teach them, we'll figure it out. Uh, they don't understand, we need to teach them the syntax and the words of Clojure. So we take their computers, we install Clojure, we download an IDE, we talk about the REPL, we talk about indentation, we decide whether we want to use parn for or par edit, we talk about key bindings, some people might throw in concurrency, parallelism, immutability, right? And you just drive people insane with this stuff. We're beginners, you know? They don't get it. So, and then think about that. What does, what does that, all of these steps that I just talked about, what does that have to do with the difference between what you and a beginner sees in your mind's eye, right? Sort of the idea that a canvas pops up and that there will be lines drawn between, between dots. That is actually not about the syntax and the words of the language or any language. It's more about you understanding this paradigm of programming. What is going on? What is a sequence of things that gets transformed or is used to do something else? That is what this is about. Um, and this is also a bit like being taught music by reading or writing sheet music, right? Uh, as a trained, mu trained musician, you can probably read this and hear the music in your head. But as a beginner, it really helps to experience the music. And code and music are very similar in the sense that there's a static representation of instructions that is interpreted into a dynamic performance. Right? It's, it's really, it's, it's so similar, it's surprising. Um, what's very strange then is that we teach beginners to write the equivalent of sheet music without performing much music at all. And arguably, argu arguably, you can learn to make music without any sheet music simply by jamming on instruments. And that music doesn't have to be rhythmic or harmonic, right? You can be fuzzy about it, you can make a lot of wrong music, but just touch an instrument and a sound will probably come out of it. If you kind of touch it kind of right. Um, there will be some, some noise, like you can play with that. Um, or take a Rubik's Cube, you can use a Rubik's Cube without solving it, right? So you can basically use it wrong forever, you can still use it wrong. With code, however, it's like one little mistake and the code doesn't compute or it doesn't compile. And if you think about it, with code, it's, it's, it, you can be double wrong, right? You can write logically wrong code that still needs to have the right syntax to be understood by the computer. So you can be wrong on a syntax level, just in trying to communicate what you want to do, and you can be wrong logically. And I think um, people are actually quite good at the logical level. They're quite good at saying like, oh yeah, I want this collection of things to be transformed. Um, but the syntax level is just this, this huge barrier of entry um, that we put in front of beginners uh, that makes them feel stupid. So, um, if code is sheet music, then what is the music, right? What's the music of code? Um, and I think it's code execution. It's the process of running the code. And that like we said before, that doesn't happen in the code, in the file, right? You don't see it in the file. It actually happens in the runtime, you know? It happens in your head and it happens on the computer. And in that sense, code is actually a performance, right? It's a performance of sorts. There's a process. It's not static, it's dynamic. So if code is a performance, why don't we perform it? And that led to a workshop called Embodied Code. Um, the idea of Embodied Code is to learn the basics of programming in physical space through art, movement, and games. 
Uh, as the name implies, we embody or enact code. Um, it's a little hard to explain, so let's have a look at it. First, we look at some code again. Um, here we have a def, a vector of dance moves. Some random dance moves, uh, or some dance moves in here. Then we have a function called person with dance move that takes a person, which is a map, and associates a random dance move to that person. Lastly, um, we take people, which is defined somewhere, we take people and we map over it and we assign a random dance move to every person. Okay, so this is what we did um, here. Let's see. Of course. All right. Cool. Okay, so, so you're the random person, then. Okay. You you add the dance with the sign to the person, and I take the composition of both of you. And I just explain. Um, the person in the middle with the basket uh, is the rand end function. They just have the basket. They pick out dance moves out of that basket. Um, the person to the right with the black shirt is a sos, the whole sos expression. That person assigns the dance move to the person. I am map. Okay, I'm walking around and I make sure that the composition of the two is being applied to people individually. This guy got a moonwalk. Okay, this guy's doing a moonwalk, and that happened. Um, excuse the butt in the frame. Good friend of mine. Um, so, cool. So uh, now everyone has a dance move. Right? Uh, basically, we, we went through the whole collection of people, and everyone eventually had a dance move. Now we want to group them by that dance move. Okay? So let's see what that looks like. We need one person who is like dance move. It's going to give us the dance move, and then we'll need another person who is a little kid, by the way. Uh, it's my daughter. <laughs> okay. So I'm basically asking um, who, can be, who can be dance move and who can be grouped by. Right, we need those. We need those two. Um, this uh, Rachel here, she uh, volunteered for dance move, and Walter with the orange sweater is group by. And then they go. Rachel goes and she asks, "What's your dance move?" She gets the dance move. That dance move is the uh, the blow up uh, thing at like the shopping center, you know. So <laughs> that's the dance move they came up with. Um, you know, there they go. Yeah, she's doing a great job of that, that, that performance. There we go. Yeah. OK. Um, cool. And what I really like is I like looking at this um, at high speed. Because what you see is, I mean, if you think about group by, who knows group by? All right, everyone knows group by. If you think about group by, right, you get, you, you get back a, um, a hash map um, that, that contains sequences ordered by um, your group function, you know? Uh, so the keys are the result of the function being applied to the object, and then you have uh, a collection of, of things in there. So you kind of, spatially, you kind of have clusters, you have groups um, that are separate. And then if we look at this, we kind of see that, you know, the, all, the, all the shopping center blow up people get, get sorted, and, and we, we see how group by and the dance move um, key are moving together. Uh, to make this happen. Let's look at it again. So you're going to move in, in all kinds of directions, and in the end, we have several groups of people um, that stand uh, together. All right, so um, after the dance and movement stuff, we started getting into drawing. Um, so my friend Chloe uh, did um, a connect the dots puzzle. She came up with a bunch of points. Um, so this is basically a vector of vectors of two tuples, where um, each two tuple is a, a point, and um, these, the vectors represent lines individually. Um, so every participant in the workshop got assigned a line, and then it was the same thing. We reduce over the canvas and draw the lines one by one. So um, actually, my daughter gave the final drawing uh, to her teacher, and it, we never got it back. So I can only show you the digital version now. Um, look like this. OK. So that's, that's the cat. And then there was an idea of saying, like, OK, let's do this again, but let's get a little creative about it. You have two dots. What can you do between the dots? Um, 
Um, maybe you can introduce some other patterns. So one, one idea is to just wiggle your pen, right, as you, go, as you go through it, and you'll get something that is a little more creative. Um, and we wrote the code for that uh, to basically add some jitter, um, add some randomness between, like interpolate a few points between points and add that. Um, and it leads to some pretty interesting results, right? You start out with a few coordinates and then you get something that's fuzzy and more interesting. Um, so here they are in comparison. Um, yeah, so Alan Kay has this thing, uh, he gave it in a talk from 2015. Uh, he said, uh, problem finding is more important uh, than problem solving. And I think if we apply this to education, we get that learning environments are greater than teaching environments. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the idea is that one is about exploration and discovery, and the other one is about filling in something that's predefined, right? It's kind of bottom up versus top down. Um, one of my favorite books is uh, A Pattern Language. I think Design Patterns and Programming has been uh, inspired by that book. Um, and there's a great quote which I'll read. In a, society, <clears throat> in a society which emphasizes teaching, children and students and adults become passive and unable to think or act for themselves. Creative, active individuals can only grow up in a society which emphasizes learning instead of teaching. And that's kind of the idea in Embodied Code. Um, a lot of the programmers that I got involved to do the workshop, they asked me what should I do, and I said nothing, just be there. Um, because the idea is that everyone, everyone there is at the same level. People sort of, you know, dancers kind of help programmers to move more beautifully or show them, give them ideas on how to move through a room elegantly. And then uh, programmers have the knowledge to make sure they move correctly. And um, it's also designed to be, even though it's very analog, it's designed to be very immersive. Um, we kind of want to connect the familiar, because we're dealing with beginners, they don't know code. We want to connect what they know with the novelty, with what they're exploring. So people use their bodies. Um, there's a sense of space and time. There is music and rhythm. Um, actually, one of the games in the workshop uh, is about race conditions, and unsurprisingly, it's a race. So we have a race in there. Um, I think we involve all senses, but um, smell and taste. Maybe uh, smell accidentally. And yeah, and this, this all is just there to, to use the familiar as a bridge to the new. Um, the way we usually teach programming is in this order, right? We kind of, in, in order for the computer to understand us, we need to get the syntax right. Next, we need to speak the words that the computer understands. So these are pre-requirements to get to running code, to get to the meaning. And that's the order we also teach in because you can't get anything done on a computer without that. Um, but I think a lot of people are scratching their head. They're like, I know what I want to do. Why can't I just do it? Um, so I think what we need to do is we need to flip that. Um, we need to go from, we need to have a, that's kind of a teaching environment approach and we need to get to a learning environment approach where we start out with the meaning of what we want to do and then we discover how we can get there um, on computers. So we're doing the exact reverse in, in embodied code. Cool, so that's embodied code. Uh, you saw some videos. I'll share the GitHub repo with the current curriculum or just like ideas um, um, towards the end. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress, so um, you can talk about it later. Be happy to chat um, with anyone. And um, I wanted to thank um, all these people. And uh, I think David Schmuda, who you might know, is like one of the first people I kind of shared this with back in Berlin. And we just talked about it for three hours. And, uh, and then, and then I uh, applied to the conch with just the idea for the talk, and uh, it was accepted. So then I forced it. It was the force function. It took six weeks and I just cranked out the whole thing. Um, <laughs> cool. So um, yeah, please say hello. Um, this is the this is our studio, lumberdev.nyc. Um, me on Twitter. Me on GitHub. 
the repo for the curriculum. Um, and this is, was actually a very short talk, so we have some time for a QA. and a um, And uh, if you want, you can also run over and like, catch the tail end of the other talk. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't want to fluff it up. It's, it's like, this is all I have for tonight, uh, today. Um, thank you.